back up in there. I think I see two here. One down front here. Frank Schaefer will uh, speak for about 40 minutes. Uh, we'll have uh, three panelists who I'll introduce at a later time who will uh, respond for about five minutes apiece and then we'll open this up to a question and answer period. Frank Schaefer is the son of Francis and Edith Schaefer. The Schaefer family have been since 1955 uh, when the uh, Labrie community was founded in Switzerland at the forefront of evangelical and reformed traditions in North America and Europe. Frank Schaefer became uh, more involved in the leadership of Labrie at a filmmaking level in the mid to late 1970s when he worked with his father to produce the films uh, How Should We Then Live and Whatever Happened to the Human Race. Frank has made an intriguing journey at the highest levels of leadership from within the reformed and evangelical traditions uh, to the orthodox way. And at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Frank Schaefer. He said he'd wave if it gets too long, but you can just throw stuff. So, uh, I, there's a clock up there. So, yeah, I, I'll take care of it. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, help me out just for a second. Let me see a show of hands of who are students here at this school and whose town. Students first, and then town. Okay, more students. That's good. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'll pretend it's not required, and you chose to be here. <laughs> I'm very flattered. Uh, um, I came in from Boston yesterday where uh, I live just north of the city with my wife Jeannie. Um, my life on a practical level is divided between two things, writing, which I do early in the morning, and taking care of two of my uh, four grandchildren in the afternoons, Lucy, who is five, Jack, who's three, and a little unborn girl who will be born in April who will also be living across the street that Jeannie and I will be taking care of. So my next project is fixing up an area that used to be a porch as a big playroom uh, since Jeannie and I have started our childcare years over again at age uh, 62 and, and uh, 63. Uh, my writing is impacted by having these little kids in my life realizing uh, in, in comparison to being a grandfather what a crappy parent I must have been because I was so involved with trying to do everything correctly and raise these kids and teach them stuff. Whereas with these two little ones that I have now, uh, it really only boils down to one thing, and that is the love we exchange every day in what are the, literally the happiest years of my life uh, with these children and the light they give me and the absolute pleasure of unconditional love being exchanged between a grandparent and a child, that level of trust, uh, where my little Lucy in church last Sunday, when we were in the communion line, I knelt down and I told her that I loved her with all my heart, and she gave me this big hug and said, Ba, she calls me Ba, you're the best grandfather in the world. This from a five-year-old, and by five, you, you haven't learned to lie yet, so it's, you, you, this is for real. And uh, I always tell Lucy when I go away anywhere that uh, my heart gradually empties out, and I ask her for a big hug before I go on a speaking trip uh, and she um, always gives me a big hug, and I tell her, okay, you're filling my heart back up again for the trip. And afterwards, with all seriousness, again, as a five-year-old, a guileless child, she looks at me, and she says, Is, did I fill your heart up enough to go to Canada? Because she knew it was a long trip. Today, I called her on the phone, and she says, well, what's in Canada? And I'm, I'm staying at a monastery, and I said, there are monks and bears in Canada. <laughs> And she said, if you see one, send me a picture of it, it being both monks and bears. So I said, I didn't know about the bears, but I would try to get a picture of a monk, which I did, Vladika. Uh, the archbishop is here. So I have a picture of the, of the archbishop and me, so I at least come back with a picture of a monk. Um, so that's the context in which I work and, and in which I live. Uh, as a writer and as a grandfather, which are the, my two preoccupations uh, at this time in my life. <clears throat> my background uh, is a bit different. 
And that is, uh, starting again with a little bit of family history, um, Jeannie and I have been together since we were 17 and 18 when I got her pregnant when we were teenagers in Switzerland, living in this religious community of Labrie. And uh, in those days, before my dad had gotten into the religious rite and had become known, Labrie was kind of a fundamentalist, Calvinist, hippie commune, if that all goes together. Um, and essentially, uh, we had all kinds of people. Kim Timothy Leary, for instance, who was the Harvard professor that introduced LSD into American pop culture, had come to Labrie to study. Jeannie, in fact, my wife uh, of uh, 43 years now, and my, 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 uh, the grandmother of these grandchildren, was traveling in, in Europe with her sister Pam, and um, they were visiting uh, a friend at Labrie who was a friend of her sister's who was there as Joan Baez's best friend who was checking Labrie out because Joan Baez was going to come visit us. And Jeannie's was a good old San Francisco hippie princess. This is 68, 69. Uh, she, had had a, she had a boyfriend in the States, and before that she had been dating the drummer of Santana. Uh, and so when I referred to the fact that Billy Graham was going to visit us, the, uh, the, the evangelist, she said, wow, I didn't know Bill Graham was into Jesus. And I said, well, who are you talking about? <laughs> and she said, well, the Fillmore West, of course, uh, where she had seen the Rolling Stones three times. Who's done that? I mean, and not when they were 70 years old either. I mean, <laughs> back in those days. <coughs> so she descended into my life, and, and a gorgeous, gorgeous woman. Um, I proposed to her for a year solid from the second night we met. And we met, by the way, because uh, I had Abbey Road, which has just been released. And so like, I was also an artist. So it was a combination of come to my studio, I will show you my etchings. Uh, and I have Abbey Road. And that's how I seduced her down to where I was and pried her away from the drummer of Santana. Um, and about six months later, got her pregnant. And three or four months after that, we got married. And for some reason, uh, it worked out with a lot of ups and downs, a lot of upheavals, uh, maybe having been a very difficult person to live with a lot of the time. But there you go. Um, so now, my oldest granddaughter, who lives in Brussels with my daughter and her husband and my grandson, are the age of my contemporaries' children because they're 20 and 17. And these days, people wait till they're 40 and the biological clock's running, and then they realize they've run out of time, and they send to Australia for a frozen embryo or something, and they get it implanted and have that child. So their kids are the age of my oldest grandchildren. My youngest grandchildren are the age you're supposed to have grandchildren at my age, and everything kind of catches up with itself. But the changes in, in genies in my life encompass a, a much bigger framework than that. Thumbnail sketch. Um, when, I, when Jeannie met me, I did have a studio because I was painting, and I was kind of a prodigy uh, outside of the evangelical context. Dad was having a lot of art festivals at Labrie. He might be known now as, the, as Jerry Falwell's buddy and the person who hung around with presidents turning America to the right wing on the abortion issue. But back in those days, Labrie was one of the only evangelical places that took culture seriously. So. I knew who Lorenzo de' Medici was and that Simonetta Vespucci had been Botticelli's model long before I knew any names of American baseball teams. I just thought this is what everybody thought about. When Dad wanted to spend some time with me, he said, I've robbed you. I've been giving time to the ministry. I need to get to know you now. I was 15. We headed down to Italy, and we hung around the Uffizi Gallery for two weeks, talked about the Renaissance. And he wasn't talking about Reformed theology or Jesus Christ or anything else. He was just telling me, what was important about Renaissance painting and why Masaccio and Giotto come before Botticelli? What happened next when it got into the, to, to, to the high Renaissance and so forth? This was the world he brought me up in. I dropped out and ran away from a high school in Britain where I was in a private boys school and I ran away at age 15. My parents were wonderful people, knew I was interested in painting, set me up with a studio. When we had arts festivals at Labrie, there were evangelicals coming from places like Wheaton College or Gordon College, evangelical schools who were shocked because dad was showing Fellini films in our chapel, nudity and all, Roma, La Dolce Vita, whatever. How can a Christian place be doing this? So what an irony to fast forward into my teenage years, late teens, early 20s, when all of a sudden, because of the abortion issue, dad is now a darling of what was then emerging as the religious right, 
Had they come to Libri when Jeannie and I were up in the field smoking pot together, or had they come to Libri when I was getting her pregnant, or when Timothy Leary was there, or Joan Baez came, or the time I was, my first paying job as a teenager was helping to do some road work for the Led Zeppelin in the Montreux Rock and Jazz Festival. I met Jimmy Page down there, the, the lead guitarist of the Led Zeppelin, for those of you who don't know who he is, and he had a book in his back pocket. And I looked at the book and I thought the cover was familiar, and I was just a guy helping with the lights, and you don't talk to the stars because then everybody gets pissed off because you're just this kid working and you're lucky to be there, but you don't approach the musicians. But I happened to see it was the British edition of my dad's book, Escape from Reason. So I, I got up my courage, and I went up and I asked Jim Page, and I said to him, hey, you know, you're reading a book, who are you, you know, and it was a bit strawberry. I said, well, my dad wrote that book. How, how did you get it? He says, oh, man, it's very cool, very cool. Eric Clapton gave it to me last week, told me I had to read it. This is not what you would think of as the founder of the religious right. I mean, Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page were not reading books by Jerry Falwell. <laughs> All right? So you have to understand, this was my youth. This was my youth, not my young adulthood. When Dad took a stand on the abortion issue, and if you're ever interested in really finding out what I'm talking about here on a, uh, on a more in-depth level, you can read my memoir, Crazy for God, which um, <coughs> has been out for a while now. It's in paperback and all the rest of it, where I tell the whole evolution of the religious right from the point of view of someone who lived it. <coughs> Dad took a stand on Roe v. Wade and the legalization of abortion, partly because of my urging to do so. I was ardently pro-life at that point. As a, as a kid. Another reason he took a stand to be very brutally honest with you is because his son, who had gotten this girl pregnant and now had a second child on the way, needed a job. This is a dropout who's an artist. How the hell is he going to pay the bills? Billy Zioli, the president of Gospel Films, visits and says, I'd like to make a meeting with Francis Schaeffer. How do you get to a father? Well, you get to a father by buying one of his son's paintings and saying, why doesn't your father do something on art and culture? And by the way, I'll make you producer at the tender age of 20 or 21. And I came to dad and pitched him the project. And all of a sudden, one thing led to another. And we made this series called How Should We Then Live About Art and Culture. But the last three episodes were about abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, and all the human life questions that have now become the formative litmus test of American politics, out of which all the gay bashing and everything else devolved in later years as an appendage of what was the original energy, which was the pro-life movement. So Dad and I then made a second series called Whatever Happened to the Human Race. And in that, we featured Dr. C. Everett Koop, who as a reward for making that series with us was made Surgeon General by Ronald Reagan a couple of years later. And Chick Koop, C. Everett Koop, who's passed away recently, was then the Surgeon in Chief at the Philadelphia Children's Hospital, where I went to live for six months while shooting the movie with him. And at that point, I was producing and directing, and I'd always wanted to get into film. So, you know, two birds with one stone, we're going to save America, and I'm going to have a movie career. So it all worked out fine. And I was in the hospital making this movie with him. And we went on a seminar tour around the country and started playing to arenas of 16 and 20,000 people. Jerry Falwell lent us his jet, and, and a couple of years later, I was the keynote speaker in the tender age of 25 or something at the Southern Baptist Convention, 23,000 pastors. Uh, this was like the late 70s, early 80s, all blue polyester. You've never seen so much powder blue. Uh, <laughs> wide stitching. Whatever else you say about the late 70s, fashion was just crap. And that's how that is. I'm sorry to say it. But I'm standing behind the curtain at this point. Remember, this is the kid who enjoyed the Fellini festivals. And I met Jimmy Page, and he was so cool in reading my dad's book. Now I'm making a lot of money. I have an American Express credit card. I have a staff, and I'm in Jerry Falwell's jet. And I'm in my mid-20s, and I've got two kids, and no trouble paying the bills now. There is big, big, big money in the North American God Hills, if you want to go mine for it. And all of a sudden, I'm standing back there thinking to myself, um, and I, I don't mean to be too graphic here, and I, well, I won't use too much profanity, but you know, basically, I'm screwed, except I said it more uh, directly to myself involving a, a very basic reproductive bodily function. I'm that. <laughs> Just before I walked up to the podium and gave a speech for which I got a standing ovation and was good enough at what I did, just genetically, and because I've been raised on sermons, that the next invitation I get is the keynote speaker uh, sharing the stage with Ronald Reagan at the, 
at the annual religious broadcasters convention, and then after that, we're in the White House talking to, the, to, to various presidents. And I'm a kid. I'm not telling the story of the religious right. I'm sort of telling you my story. I'm a kid. All of a sudden, I'm, a ho I'm away from home six months of the year, and I'm on a speaking thing. There were more people at my book, at my dad and my and our book table at any given moment than are in this room. Um, I can remember counting out $275,000 in cash with our staff one night just from the take of the book and tape sales in Dallas after a three-day conference. Okay, you got to understand the scale of this stuff. It's crazy. Now, my father, unlike most evangelical leaders, and I'm not being facetious here, was not a thief. So none of that money was going into our pockets. He was still working on the edge of his bed at home in a rocking chair, did not own a car, never flew first class, always asked them to downgrade our hotel because he said he'd be ashamed to be in a suite when people were sacrificially giving to Labrie, and his book income was millions of dollars, and he was putting it all back into his ministry and not taking it in perks and all the kind of thing that Franklin Graham's doing today with his so-called Samaritan's Purse where his salary is $640,000 a year, according to the Wall Street Journal, not counting perks, taken from money people are giving as charitable donations to help the poor. But that's the world I was in. All right, that's the world I was in. And there was a lot of money in it, but I was also losing my faith. There is no quicker way to lose your faith on God's green earth than to be a full-time Christian worker. And the more successful you are, the further away you will get from any idealism or any truth. It all is bullshit. You get exactly the same thing that happens to the big time politicians. No matter what their intention at the beginning, by the time it's all over, they're in the system and they can't help it. You can't judge them for it because I'll tell you what, there's not a person sitting in this room who would not fall in that situation. It is absolutely crazy to have people clustering around you. I can remember going through an airport one time my parents had already gone through, and I was kind of bringing up the rear, and some lady runs over from across the thing and just and grabs my arm and says, I just wanted to touch a Schaefer. Now, you replicate that 50 times a week, and you have cash on, lying on the table, and pretty soon you're going to be Jim Baker, no matter who you started out as. Okay, so my dad died in 84, and I still remembered I wanted to be an artist, and basically at that point I had a thing called Frank Frankie Schaefer Productions, we had $3.8 million in the bank, and I called Jim Bouffier, who was my partner, and I said, I'm done. My dad's dead. I hate this world that I'm in. I never was called to do this. It's crap. The deeper I get, the more I realize that we are a bunch of, even if we're not con men, we're in a con world. There's not a genuine note in this whole thing. I'm through. I'm finished. I'm going crazy. And in addition to which, this girl I love, Jeannie, is preparing to leave me, not threatening to, but I'm treating her like shit because I am now an asshole, not just by birth and genetic disposition, but I am, a, I am the kind of person who's on the road six months a year, doesn't see his own children, doing God's work, working with people who are totally in it for the buck. You have not lived until you've been on the 700 Club seven or eight times. Dr. Dobson gave away a quarter of a million copies of my book, A Time for Anger. I'm, I'm making more money in a week than I now make at age 62, seriously, in a year. Because it was just selling books by the pallet load, not because they were any good, they were just evangelical screeds that had the Schaefer name on them. I have no illusion about that, but it was part of a movement. And uh, we were hanging around with all these people and so forth and so on. Life was moving very fast, but fortunately, like some guy who's just drowning when the Titanic goes down, when my dad died, my mother and a bunch of other people at his lost total control of his funeral and all these evangelical leaders pulled in and it was a complete circus. And I didn't even have a chance to grieve for my father, who by the way, I love dearly. Don't read any of this as having abandoned his legacy. It's exactly the opposite. I'm much closer to my father before all this started happening today than I was when I was at the height of all this evangelical BS. The fact of the matter is, we had all gotten lost in this shuffle Dad is now remembered as a founder of the religious right, whereas if you read any of his books written before he got into the religious right, none of them read political. You can disagree with the philosophy, you can hate the theology, but no one's going to know how he voted in the next election reading Escape from Reason, or The God Who Is There, or Pollution in the Death of Man, or Death in the City, or The Great Evangelical Disaster, or any of these books. 
He was a Christian apologist. Agree or disagree, he was not a man of the right or left. He was trying to talk about Jesus, and he was trying to talk about relating cultural issues to Christian teaching. But what, of course, he's remembered for is this kind of hijacked career in the, in the crosshairs of this vicious American business of the religious right, which now has remanifested itself as the Tea Party, for instance. So the other day I get a call, it wasn't the other day, last year or the year before from the New Yorker wanting, because they're doing an article on Sarah Palin, and lo and behold, it's like, okay, just shoot me now. Um, <laughs> are you calling me to ask about my last novel? No. Sons of bitches haven't reviewed it. Are you calling me because you've heard I've started painting again and you see what I'm, no, of course not. I'm calling you because we're interviewing Sarah Palin and she says she got into politics because of you and your father. Meanwhile, I'm, the, I'm one of the first bloggers on Huffington Post, and I got a note from the White House the other day, and this was the other day, saying, by the way, do you realize you've written more in support of Barack Obama than any other American writer? To date, 380,000 words. That's a thick book in Post for Huffington and for Alternet and for <laughs> Pathios and other people. And so that's who I am now, and they're asking me to explain Sarah Palin to them, and it's basically... You know, it's basically like I have to go hold Lucy for an hour. <laughs> Why are you shaking, Ba? <laughs> so talk about, you know, deja vu all over again. You can't escape this stuff. And so here I am tonight still trying to explain this to you guys. And of course, I'm also selling a book because I don't have any here to sell you, but I earn my living as a writer. And what real writers do is they repross their own life into books. So when my son served in the United States Marine Corps, having volunteered out of high school, I wrote a book called Keeping Faith, the father Son Story About Love in the United States Marine Corps, as a result of which, speaking of another apparition from outer space of a weird, crazy life, and I'm not lying, you can Google me, most of this is true. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden I'm on Oprah, and she's interviewing me as a military parent who's written this book, and I'm being read by military mothers and fathers everywhere who had never heard of Francis Schaeffer or my novels, and they just think this is my first book because I'm a military parent. And then I get people who are reading Crazy for God, that's this memoir about being evangelical, and these are evangelicals who, because I dropped out of the evangelical world, don't know that I've written five novels, don't know that I've written all these blogs for Huffington, don't know that I wrote six pieces for the Washington Post, blah, 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 blah. But they just think I've written a memoir to somehow settle the score with evangelicals because one thing, I don't know how Canada is, but I'll explain something to you about the United States. Google or no Google, we all live in these tiny little slivers of microcosms. So if you're into NASCAR, you know all about the names of drivers who like to, you know, cars turning left, cars turning left, cars turning left. If you're not into NASCAR, you don't even know where the tracks are, let alone who the drivers are. If you're an evangelical of a certain age, Francis Schaeffer's a big deal. If you're not an evangelical of a certain age, you've never heard of the guy. If you're a military parent and the commandant of the Marine Corps sends out a, a letter to all his co commanders across the globe saying, you've all got to read uh, Frank Schaefer's book, this great book about uh, having a son in the Marine Corps and the empathy of the family and so forth. They, they've never heard of Francis Schaefer and they think this is just a military parent who's written a book about being a military parent. Now, I didn't do it on purpose, but none of these parts of my life are really related to each other other than the fact that they're part of what is, in fact, a normal writing career, which reflects your own life. <coughs> After I dropped out of the movie business, got into the film business, you, very careful uh, editing of a reel out of my dad's documentaries, making sure no one who would watch this would think that it was anything to do with Christianity, the abortion issue, or anything else. Just nice photography and soundtrack. Got me an agent in Hollywood, directed four Hollywood films, all of them totally forgettable, you'd never pay to go see. One actually in Toronto called Baby on Board with Carol Kane and Judge Reinhold. Terrible movie. I got pneumonia. It's very cold there shooting a movie in the, in the wintertime. Um, hated every minute of it. <clears throat> I wish we'd been out here. Um, but during that process was also realizing that I didn't want to have anything more to do with, with uh, not only evangelicalism, but, um, you know, would not consider myself a church-going Christian, anything else at all. Not so much a rebellion, but just, hey, you know, I've been the wizard behind the curtain. Don't ask me to go do this again. I know how these tricks are done. And so, uh, you know, like a, good, like a good card 
uh, trick, you know, like uh, Ricky Jay. I mean, he know, you know, you can't fool Ricky Jay. He can do the card thing. You're not gonna, he's not gonna think, you know, this is real magic. And I was very much in that position. <coughs> a friend of mine down in Los Gatos, California, was going to a small Antiochian Orthodox church, and I had been reading some church history and also discovering, by the way, that evangelicalism is a crock when it comes to church history. It's like it was Jesus, then Martin Luther, and then <laughs> a big mess, and then our denomination. <laughs> and in, in my novel, Portofino, about a kid growing up in an evangelical family, I keep adding these acronyms where he's in the Presbyterian group called the PCUSA, and then they split, and they're called the PCCUSA, and then the PCCCCUSA, and then it's just him and his dad and two sisters and his mom. <laughs> they're the true church, and he's not sure about his sisters. <laughs> so basically, I had read some church history, and I was thinking, wow, you know, my dad was a brilliant man and knew a lot of things, but he had been educated first in Hamden Sydney University, uh, doing philosophy and theology, but then very much in the North American evangelical context, and God bless my father, but he did not know his church history in the sense that he had bought into, there's the early church, there's a mess, there's the Reformation, then there's more mess, then there's us. And, uh, and, and no one else really has the truth except here in Labri, we do it right, and people are our brothers and sisters in Christ. When I was a child, Roman Catholics were the whore of Babylon, no kidding. Dad was a real fundamentalist back then. He hadn't met people like Jimmy Page yet. Uh, not that he was a Roman Catholic, but there had been no expanding of the minds. Um, as I got older, Dad became much more universalist in his views. By the time he died in Mayo Clinic in 1984, he would have regarded the Orthodox that I go to church with every Sunday as fellow believers in Jesus Christ and as Christian as much as he was. Same for Roman Catholics, same for all other denominations. And he was even getting to the point where he wasn't sure that anybody would be in hell. So he was, he was not at a place he had been. People ask me, what would your father think about this? And I don't ask this to be a smart ass. I just say the same thing I would about myself. Well, which stage of his life are you talking about? And for those of you who are students here, I can promise you one thing tonight. And if you remember this, 20, 30, 40 years to, from now, you will say, ah, yeah, he was right about that. So try to remember this one fact so you can tell somebody when I'm dead I was right at least about one thing. No matter what you think you're sure of tonight, you will change your mind. I'm writing a book right now called Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God. It's the title of my new book. And the subtitle is How to Create Beauty, Give Love, and Find Peace. How I'm, why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God. And that kind of duality expresses where my head is at now. I would have shot myself 20 years ago to think I would have written this book, and I say in the book, and by the way, 10 years from now, I probably would write a different book, but I guarantee you, the reader, this. If you read this book now, you come back 10 years from now, you will be reading a different book, not because the magical change on the page, but because you will have changed, so this book will be different to you. So much for changeless truth. That's really how life works. So I guarantee tonight, if you were in America, this other part of America I live in, we euphemistically call America because on the North American continent, there's only one country. You know that. <laughs> and it's not you guys. <laughs> like I told my granddaughter, there are bears and monks here. That's it. <laughs> but in any case, um, in any case, I can promise you this. In, the, in my part of the North American context, I can look you in the eye and say, if you are a Tea Party voter, voter tonight, and you are a Republican pro-lifer, I guarantee you, by the time you are my age, you will have gone through several convolutions. You may be back where you started, with better reasons now, but you will not have towed this line the whole way. And I'll put it a different way. I have never met a Christian. I have never met a communist. I have never met an atheist. I've never met an agnostic. I've never met a Roman Catholic. I've never met an Orthodox. Because no one is any one thing. Don't lie to yourself and other people. There are days when you are a happily married man, but you're also someone who, on that day, doesn't like his wife. There are days when you are an Orthodox Christian, but on that day, you don't believe in God. There are moments when you're standing in line to take communion, and you have no faith. It's not that you are a liar and a hypocrite. You are a human being, and your brain, in case you didn't know it, evolved as a human primate, not to process philosophy, theology, and church history. It evolved for survival. You don't even see reality. What you see is, is 
90% of what your brain reconstructs for you because it helps you survive as something that has evolved through various stages. And we try to apply this to self-contemplation and philosophy. And we make these cosmological statements. And I'm not just talking about Christians. I'm talking about all kinds of people, uh, atheists, new atheists, and so forth, who make these vast cosmological statements as if somehow we can jump out of our own brain and examine it and the universe. And of course, you know, we're all on this flat line and path. You stare up into the sky. We talk about space travel. You know, and I just hate break the news to you. We, we actually are already in outer space. Yeah. And we are traveling. <laughs> in case you hadn't noticed that thing that Galileo said. And the whole cosmos is flying apart. We're moving at close to light speed uh, some, toward a part of the universe called the Great Attractor. It is not turtles all the way down under us, in case you wonder what's holding it all up. We've got this thin veneer of air that would be brushed away in a minute unless it was for the iron core of the globe, which, which sends out a magnetic resistance that keeps the solar energy from stripping out our atmosphere. You're already in a mystery folded within an enigma and a paradox. Don't talk to me and make universal statements of truth. You, you live your life on the basis of, of the reality around us, which is as inexplicable and mysterious as any spiritual concoction you can come up with. And the fact of the matter is, in that context, in my own journey through Christianity, the idea of having the hubris and the kind of judgmental attitude of writing people off as lost or saved, or that I have to witness to because God has somehow judged them or whatever, just simply didn't seem to make sense to me. And when you when you put in the aspect of the hypocrisy that I was seeing on a, on a huge level in myself, not other people, just me, as well as those around me, you add all that up, it was time for me to kind of get out. And so I called Jim Bufier up and I said, we have $3.8 million of cash reserves. Give it all to gospel films, because in America with the tax laws, you have to give your nonprofit 501c3 money to somebody else with the same status. Send back everything in envelopes unopened in terms of gifts and checks and donations. And I'm not talking little donations. You know, Howard Hunt, just after he cornered the silver market, handed me a quarter of a million dollars. Mary Crowley, who started Home Interiors, gave us half a million dollars. Rich DeVos, who started Amway and whose son went off and did Blackwater. You ever heard of these guys? Yeah, he gave us half a million dollars, et cetera. And so I closed the door and we just kind of sent it all back or sent it off to gospel films. And I wandered off into Hollywood to try to get jobs as a director. And then thank God for Jeannie. That's the, by the way, that's the refrain of my whole life. It's like, you know, Lord have mercy, but it's always thank God for Jeannie. <laughs> she came along at one minute and said, out of the frying pan of the fire, you're even angrier and more unhappy now in the movie business than you were in the evangelical world. And I said, yeah, because it's the same people. <laughs> Except these people are just making shitty movies and not selling Jesus, but it's the same thing. And why can't I make the kind of movie I want to go see? And she says to me, being a kind of an honest person, maybe you're no good at this. <laughs> yep. So it's one thing to speak truth to power. It's another thing to speak truth to weakness. You know? that's, that's how it happens with us. But anyway, she said, listen, instead of making all this shit, why don't you write down some of the stories you tell the children at the dining room table? OK, I'll try that. So I started to write this thing that turned into my novel Portofino. And I thought it would be a screenplay. And then it started looking like a novel. And I started it on the back of, a, of an airplane ticket folder back in the day when you had tickets and not iPhones. And I got home and I said, oh, I'll try a second chapter. I started reading out to Jeannie and she said, this is very funny. And long story short, got a quote secular agent because by that time the evangelicals were calling me a traitor and all the rest of it. Um, and I got out of the evangelical thing, got myself a New York agent who sold it to Macmillan and then to Penguin and then uh, got great reviews and it sold and translated into nine languages and The Guardian voted it one of the best 12 books in Britain and I was off as a writer. And it's like, crap, I found something I can do. And it doesn't depend on the Schaefer name because nobody buying Portofino's heard of Frank because he's been excommunicated. Um, so I know it's not uh, riding on my father's coattails. It's the opposite. They hate my guts. So it's very clear. And um, five novels later and half a dozen books in, uh, or more in nonfiction and a bunch of newspaper articles and blogs, that's what I do for a living. In uh, the late 1980s, I went to this small Antiochian church and said, I like the liturgy. It's not sermon-based. 
It attracts me because it's not all about what some guy made up last night creating his sermon. It isn't some clever grandstander making a lecture like I do. Uh, or many put it this way, I don't know how this trick is done. Uh, fourth century Byzantine liturgy, it, it doesn't come out of my world. And so I'm very honest. I'm very honest in this book I'm writing called Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God. And I say, I probably joined the Orthodox Church because it wasn't what I came out of. And I probably joined it for the same reason that I prefer watching a Shakespeare play than going to Disneyland. It's an aesthetic thing as well. Oh yeah, there's some spirituality there too. However, since it's no longer an intellectual construct of reformed theology and correct ideas, and Jesus hates you if you don't get his ideas correct, and by the way, God loves you so much that he killed his son and had him tortured to death, so you wouldn't be tortured to death. This is very nice. Uh, believe in this. This mysterious approach to faith says, oh, it's not juridical. God doesn't hate you. Jesus didn't die for your sins as in instead of you. God's not a monster who should be punched in the mouth. He actually loves you the way you love Lucy. And we celebrate this in a mysterious procession called the liturgy, which is basically the poetry and voice of the whole of humankind up until this time, very ancient, rough edges worn smooth. Nobody invented this on Friday night to wow the audience with something playing on the overhead and the rock band and the whole bit. And it just suited me fine. And frankly, I hope none of you become orthodox. Uh, I'm only joking, but I'm not trying to evangelize you because A, I don't think you're lost if you don't. You won't be any better off necessarily if you do. And this isn't proselytizing for you do, got to do what I do in the way an evangelical would, thinking you're lost if you don't buy my theology. It's just where I wound up, just like I don't think you all ought to be novelists because that's how I earn my living. That would be ridiculous. So it, it, it is very much out of my psychological baggage that I came to this. It fulfills something in me that nothing else does. And I won't tell you a big song and dance about it. I'll, up, I'll, I'll, I'll fast forward to the present again, talking about my granddaughter Lucy. But the liturgical path offers to me a way of approaching God, which is more than just good ideas or theology or systems, which don't speak to me much anymore. Again, I've been behind the curtain. I know how it's done. And I'll give you an illustration of this, and then, uh, and then we'll wrap this up and go to the next part. I get depressed sometimes. I don't know if it's clinical depression or just a recognition of, of all the failures, all the ups and downs, all the times I've treated my wife and kids like crap, mistakes made, decades lost doing stupid things, making bad movies, making bad converts to bad theology, to bad causes, uh, getting asked by Rachel Maddow again and again on MSNBC where I do commentary. You know, we have our little shtick together. Um, Frank, you used to be one of these people. Yes, I used to be one of these people. Well, how stupid are they? Oh, they're very stupid, Rachel. <laughs> and, and you were stupid like them once? Oh, yes, very, very stupid. <laughs> but now I'm very, very smart because my politics is correct, like yours. That's why you have me back all the time because we all <laughs> think the same thing. How dangerous are these people? Oh, they're very, very dangerous. Oh, and if you really want to know how dangerous they are, read my book. And um, by the way, here's a nice picture of it. And, then, and in my head, it's like, oh, that'll spike on Amazon within 36 hours. Terrific. <laughs> it's a living, so to speak. But the fact of the matter is there's a lot, of there's a lot to be depressed about in, in selling shtick about what you left and you're still trading in it, so you're still stuck. Be honest. I couldn't get on Rachel Maddow unless I was winning you know, doing this other stuff. So half the time I'm back where I started to sell books that aren't about that, but the way the world works, it's all, it's all promotion, it's all stupid, and that's what you've got to do if you want to earn your living as a writer, otherwise no one hears of your books. And by the way, I'm not alone in this, this is how it works. So, then there's bad temper, then there's fights in the family, then there's all the stuff of the young marriage to look back on, then there is relationship problems with people over the years. Then there's the theological questions, and then there's just the sense of total waste of everything because probably none of this matters anyway, and it gets to you. So I'm standing in the communion line, and in Orthodox churches, the communion line's rather long. People come up to the chalice, and each receives communion with a spoon. And when I was coming into Orthodoxy about 25 years ago, and I talked to a monk on Mount Athos in Greece, and I was saying to him in a very evangelical mode, but you give communion to newborn babies, they don't even understand what the Eucharist is. How can you give communion to a, a newborn child who doesn't even understand what this is? Coming from a Reformed Calvinist position, you always have to understand everything and read 23 books. Um, 
and get it right. How can you do this? And, and how do you do this? You give it to a child who doesn't understand. And he looked at me and wasn't being smart. And he says, do you? <laughs> that rang a bell. It was like, no, no, actually, I don't know what communion is. <laughs> it's, and, um, and so that was the beginning of a journey towards something else in which eventually, 25 years down the road, I was able to receive the experience I'll relate to you. We're all finished tonight before we go into another part. So I'm standing in the communion line, shuffling forward, and I've had Lucy or Jack on my hip so many times. Uh, every Sunday I take them up to the communion chalice, and these little children receive in the way this monk had told me that they would without all these encumbering thoughts, just the sacrament and the mystery. And, but I'm very depressed. I'm really cast into kind of a dark, despondent mood, and I've forgotten where I am, and I've even forgotten Lucy's riding my hip because she's always this little appendage anyway, so it's like basically she lives there when we're in church because Lucy's in Ba's arms, Jack's in Nana's arms, or we trade off. So there's always this little weight here. She was four. This is last year. And I'm completely lost in these dark thoughts thinking, you know, why am I standing here? I don't know what communion is. Half the time I don't know what I believe. Life is a struggle and a journey. What am I doing here? I was a crappy father. Why, what, what happened to me? You know, where did the 20 years go? Uh, how do I get all this wasted time back? Um, and then I feel this little touch on my face. And it literally jolted me out of this, this thing. And I look up thinking, what was that? Having forgotten, of course, it's Lucy, because she's here, but I'm not making the connection. Who's touching me? And all I see three inches from four inches from my face is this beautiful little girl's face, four-year-old, looking into my eyes intensely, as in like, what's wrong, kind of, ba, you know, because she sees I'm sort of standing there. Puts her little cheek on my face, hand on my cheek, jolts me in, and I look into her eyes, and I suddenly see myself as if looking through her, her eyes, because, and I know this sounds mushy, but I don't mean it as such, literally all I see is love. This girl, little girl, this little child, didn't know me when I was a shitty father wasting time in the evangelical firmament. She doesn't know all my failures. She only saw me as I was that moment and as I have been to her. And I literally had this thought in my mind. You have just seen the face of God. This is how God sees you. As you are this moment, there is no past. As you stand here now. And that Sunday I knew why I was in the communion line. And uh, it took 25 years or so to get there. But the, the mystery of grace couched in unconditional love just struck me like a thunderclap. It also revolved, uh, resolved an idea. And this is where I'll end in terms of full circle with my reformed evangelical past. And that is, if there is a God, and I say if, uh, because we all change our minds and we're open all the time to new ideas and new doubts, but if there is a God, as I hope and believe some of the time there is, then one thing does not make any sense to me. And that is, if this is how the universe occurred, all the physicists tell you that there was energy before matter, and if that energy was love, and this universe and evolution comes out of that love, and in that loving continuum, my consciousness and empathy for my little granddaughter developed as part of this evolutionary process from a creator and the original origin of this energy was love as the form from which matter came to then follow its course over billions of years. If that is true, I say if it is true, then one thing makes no sense to me at all. And that is that there is a creator who would look into my face with less love than I look into Lucy's. Because I can tell you something. There is nothing that Lucy could do ever in this life, including killing me, that would make me want to burn her in hell forever because she had the wrong ideas about me. If there's one idea that is patently stupid, it is to say that love is the energy that predates the universe. And by the way, if Lucy gets my name wrong or thinks there's three of me or worships a statue of me with four arms instead of two, or hates me and stabs me and kills me. And then somehow you reach me in the realm of the dead saying, what should happen to your little Lucy? Now she went wrong and killed you. Do you wildly imagine in your, in your most remote imagination that my answer would be burn her forever? 
That can't happen. And if an asshole like me wouldn't do that to a grandchild, don't tell me, the Lord of creation, here, here. your heavenly Father would do that to you. And to me, that is the hope of Jesus Christ. That is why I am still a Christian. And that is what I would set against any argument, any theology. I don't give a rat's ass what Calvin wrote, and I don't care what I believed, and I don't care what Paul wrote, because the witness of God to me is in the face of those I love and who love me. And if I don't see God reflected there, then there's no point even continuing the discussion. And that's where my faith is tonight, and I find a home within orthodoxy that reflects that non-retributive love of God and within a liturgy that does. And so that is the journey I took. And from far from it taking me away from an idea of a loving creator, it's the only reason I am even still in a church on Sunday, because I go there with that hope. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. And I will go to the next part of the program. <laughs>